This conference will now be recorded. Hey everyone, Leah Slaughter, hope you're doing well. I am definitely enjoying the weather we have right now. It's about time while we're all stuck at home most of the time that the weather is pretty out. Although I went outside for about 10 minutes earlier and turned red like a cherry. So I'm pretty sure that uh, we're gonna be in store for a brutal summer. Although they're saying that's gonna be great for the virus. So let's hope that's what happens. Before I get started, as always, disclaimer, this is my opinion, my best recommendation based on experience and a long time doing this, but I don't have a crystal ball. So make sure any information I give that you turn it and use it your own way, verify it with the people that you trust in your life. And of course, if you ever have any questions, I'm always here. So I have one more announcement to make. We have a new application. So it's gonna be pretty cool. You can download it on your phone and essentially you'll be able to one click into everything. You can get into your owner portal, you can join live webinars, you can access archived webinars and podcasts, you can contact team members, visit our website and social channels, and then RSVP for events and join mailing lists. And that includes our exclusive quarterly events once we get to start those back up. We are planning right now the event that we had in March, we just postponed. So I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to do that early July, maybe mid-June. I'll make that decision in the next couple of weeks, but you'll be receiving those uh, announcements and invites here within the next 10 to 14 days once we see how, really how the case is fair with Texas reopening. So let's hope everything goes well. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this class and I scheduled it right as all this kind of started is because I think that a lot of people don't understand that there's so much more to tenant screening than just looking at a background. There's so much more to placing tenants and turning a project than just getting tenants in the property. And so, you know, me specifically and the types of projects that I buy, the entire plan for the building and the property has to do with who goes in there and what my what my goal is. And so the number one thing that I want to cover today is helping you understand the thought process we go through if you follow our model to help the property be prepared to perform as well as possible and be ripe and prepared and ready for when it's time for you to sell 1031 exchange and double or take your proceeds. So we have to start with knowing your tenant. And knowing your tenant doesn't just mean the tenant that's living in your property, it also means the tenants that are coming into your property. So the most important thing when we're doing marketing is to target the right people. And so I talk about this a lot. We talk about why there's certain areas we avoid, why there's certain markets we avoid. And it's because an area is going to drive the type of person that you want in that property. And so if you buy in an area where that tenant doesn't exist, it's going to be very hard to get that tenant. And so for people that are buying in many different areas and many different property classes, you have to tailor your expectations to your product. And so for me, that was a hard lesson in the beginning because I had some great projects in some really bad areas and you just have to change your thinking. My Longview project is a perfect example of that. It looks beautiful, it returns fantastic, but I'm not gonna get the same tenants in that property that I'm gonna get in my multifamily properties in other cities. And so you just have to know what clientele is available in that area and what clientele can you cater to with any marketing that you do. One of the things when we take over a project that has tenants in place, and you know, we talk about these quarterly walkthroughs. Well, one of the things that we do at those walkthroughs is get a feel for the building. We get a feel for the grounds. We get a feel for the area. You know, we try to keep it as consistent as possible with the same people visiting the property so that they can really keep an eye on it and watch as it transforms or as we need to transform it. So most of you know, we're known as the fixers. A lot of people hire us because they've got really bad problems with either their self-managing a new property they bought or their current property manager. And so when we walk into example, a multifamily project, one of the first things we have to do is assess all of the leases, assess all of the tenants in the properties to figure out what we need to do. So you always have to know what your current tenant mix is. And this includes employment. And this is more important, I think, now than ever, because many times we just want them to make enough money and have consistent income and show that they can afford the property. Well, now we kind of have to think, is this a job that is gonna sustain? Is this a job that is high risk? And I beg the question, is this a job that's essential? And so that's something we need to start thinking about. And then what changes do you want to make based on what you know is there, based on what we find, based on our visit? 
if you have five or six tenants smoking in the property or use my Longview project again, you've got 10 tenants throwing block parties every night, drinking and all sorts of things. What changes do you want to make to that tenant quality? Are your tenants historically paying late? And this is something that we have to look at not only pre-coronavirus, but now during coronavirus. So right now, pretty much all leases are up for renewal. And so if you have a tenant that is already struggling, but maybe they've been great till now, is that a tenant that you want to keep? Is that a tenant that you think is going to be good long-term? Are we having a lot of evictions with the tenant quality of the property that you've acquired? Are we seeing criminal activity? Are they billing back utilities? Is it individually metered? If it is, why are utilities in your name? You would be amazed how many properties are individually metered where landlords are paying all of the utilities when we take over management. It's a huge issue. And there's a misconception that all bills paid apartments are common. They're not. They were a long time ago. And specifically older buildings were built with a lot of common meters not really the case so much anymore. So very important, if you have individual metering, make sure the tenant pays their own utility bills and puts it in their own name. What are you located close to? This is a big one for me when I'm looking for the areas that we deal in investment property, because I want to make sure that we're in an area that targets the type of tenant that we want. So we might be near colleges, but colleges, their students are typically not the tenant class that we are seeking. We are seeking the people that are employed by our employers that are located close to and piggyback on the college. We're looking for where employers are, where mass transit is. These are all things that go into play. For example, if you're dealing in Section 8 tenants and your property is not located near mass transit, it's going to be very difficult to lease it because historically they have lower income, fewer of them have vehicles, they need to be able to get around with mass transit. So little things that we have to think about when we are looking at who your tenants are and who we want your tenants to be. Now, there's a lot of statistics that we look at when it comes to assessing rent rates and assessing where we're gonna price that property. So 88% of property managers increased rental rates in the last 12 months. I would say in Texas, the people who did not increase rent rates, it's one of two things, either at least so high last time that there's just not enough room to increase it to, you have to weigh the options and weigh the pros and the cons. So if your property is $25 under right now on your lease of where you could potentially rent it on a renewal, it may not be worth raising that rent because if the tenant leaves and you have to re-rent it, you may wind up behind and not wind up ahead. And so sometimes we make an educated decision to leave the rent where it is. But we have a lot of properties where we've raised 150 or $200 this year, and there's just no way that you can leave a tenant in that type of rate. And when we're looking at alternate financing, when things are getting tighter and coronavirus is affecting things for refinancing, your P&L, all those different things, that rent rate makes a huge difference. I'm always looking for ways to increase the profitability of my portfolio. I can tell you yesterday I swapped insurance policies to NREIG, which was the class I did last week, and I'm saving $1,200 a month on just the first batch of properties that I switched over to them. So little things that you can do have a big bang, and of course, the bigger your portfolio, the more small changes are going to turn into big money changes. Home ownership rates are at a 50 year low. I talk about this a lot because half of Americans don't own a home and they have no plans to. You look at Dallas County, for example, 50% of Dallas County are renters. That means that one in every two properties has to be a rental property. Think about that for a minute. Imagine that every other home on your block or if you live in an apartment, every other apartment, if they're condos individually owned, must be a rental property. There's just not that many rentals. 2,600 people become renters every day. And I would, I would venture to say that that number is higher right now. If anything, this crisis is probably gonna make people less likely to buy, especially the younger generations that are already wary on it. 77% of Americans own smartphones. 91% of apartment residents use a mobile device when looking for an apartment. 90% of people looking for their next place look online first, more than 60% on a phone. Now. With what's going on right now, I would also venture to guess that those numbers are probably much higher. So as you can see from this, it's very important that digital marketing and utilizing the internet is used in your marketing plan. The old adage of just putting a sign in your yard, yes, it helps. Yes, it works. 
Is it gonna get you top dollar quickly every time? Absolutely not. Now, online is the gold standard. Anyone in our business knows this. You can look to see that brokerages are turning digital. Things are changing with our market. And there's a lot of lawsuits going on right now about MLS access because they believe it should be open to all agents, not just individual realtor associations. So you look at a company like us and our coverage territory, we have to join every single area's MLS realtor association just to be able to list properties. And then you've got some MLSs like Waco, for example, where they don't even allow you to list rentals. There's a lot of changes happening in the marketplace, a lot of lawsuits about this, and it'll be very interesting to see where things end up. Zillow is one of those items I'm gonna cover in a little bit because Zillow has made a lot of changes to make it more difficult for listing as well. So online marketing must be the core of any marketing plan. Very, very important. A sign in the yard is a must. It's important unless you're in a high risk area. When you're in a high risk area, you have a higher rate of vandalism. When we're around the holidays or when we're in lower markets or where there's things going on where people are struggling financially, vandalism tends to have an uptick. So just make sure you keep that in mind. So right now we're not doing as many signs as we were six months ago. And certainly in summer, it's less likely that you're gonna need a sign than it is in December. So it's very important to make sure, again, know your area, know your product. If you're in an area where there's a lot of gang activity, vandalism, drug deals, those types of things, you really don't wanna be advertising a vacancy. And although we do everything we can to avoid vacancy, when we're acquiring properties, we often cannot do anything but have it in the beginning, especially if you're renovating properties, buying value plays, there's going to be a period where you're doing renovation and that property is going to be vacant. So very important that you have a two month re-renting period in your leases. Those of you with us, you know that's one of the first things we do. We put a lease in place with that. And if you have a lease that doesn't have that, at renewal, we're gonna put it in there. Often when we have a property that's vacant, there's some different things that we're gonna look at. Number one, we're not always gonna seek top dollar. It depends on the time of year, depends on the competition, depends on what the market is doing. So we may start 25 or $50 lower for the first lease up, get someone in there faster. And the reason being is a $25 difference in rent is the same thing as a week vacant. So if by going in $25 lower, it rents two weeks faster, you're ahead. $50 reduction is the same thing as two weeks vacant. So if it rents a month faster, you're still two weeks ahead. So again, we're always looking at the numbers and looking at the different ways that we can play with things to try to make sure that whatever choice we make, whether it's raising the rent, keeping the rent the same, whether it's dropping the rent to incentivize someone to lease quickly, in the end, do you break even? And that's the question. If you can wind up ahead, then it's worthwhile. One of the things that you'll see us do, and I'm gonna talk about some incentive-based marketing ideas when a property's not leasing, is free rent with immediate move-in. Why do we do that? Well, again, back to our $25 and $50 number, if you lease it for immediate occupancy, you're no longer gonna have a vacancy. They move in quicker than they typically would because most good qualifying tenants have to give notice where they are. So either they're already in a notice period or they're gonna give notice once they're accepted, which that's very common because many people think they're gonna have difficulty finding a place in a housing shortage or that they may not qualify if they have blemishes on their record. So then if your property is available now because you've just renovated it or whatever the situation may be, they have to give 30 day notice. They're not going to want to double pay for 30 days, but you offer them free incentive of free rent. They're a lot more likely to do so. Don't get stuck on your price on your first vacant listing. That small price reduction goes a long way and it's something that we can always raise it again next time. And as always, if you have any questions along the way, there's the chat bar there. You can ask them as I go. Now, non-conventional marketing avenues have become a big thing. Craigslist, Facebook, Green Sheets, there's lots of different things that we can utilize. I'm not a big fan of Craigslist, and there's been a lot of articles written about this, but essentially what happens is we put it on Craigslist, and when we talk about tenant caliber, not a lot of high quality tenants go to Craigslist. And we're gonna talk about why that is in a minute, but the problem is people are gonna copy your listing, they're gonna put it up cheaper, and then those people are going to tell people they're overseas, they're serving in the military, they just need to send them money orders. And in your head, you're probably thinking, well, nobody's gonna fall for that. And I'm here to tell you they fall for it every single day. I can't tell you how many times we get a call that somebody found a fake listing on Zillow or Craigslist, they sent the money, then they couldn't get key access, they couldn't reach whoever it was, and they finally go to the property, they see our sign in the yard, and then they call us. 
And unfortunately, it's something that you as the landlord and us as the property manager can't stop. But I do believe that it's something that unless we really, really, really need to list it on Craigslist, we're not going to. But they do get 50 billion page views a month. So we have to keep that in mind for hard to lease properties. Facebook Marketplace is huge, and we put almost all properties on Facebook Marketplace. I can tell you my far out apartments that I renovate, before I ever list them, I put them on Marketplace and I lease almost 100% just off Marketplace leads. It's huge for apartments and it's huge and very hard to target areas. So if you have a property in a very rural, very outside of the metro area where you can't really target with MLS and there may not be a lot of agents or marketing happening, Facebook targets that exact city, that exact area. So some of the cities that I buy in may only have two or 3,000 residents. And by putting those on Marketplace, we're able to target the people in those areas because a lot of people use Marketplace. It's just very popular for buying and selling items. And there's a specific rental section. Now, we used to be able to do boosted posts on Facebook where we could target renters, but then Facebook decided that that was discriminatory and they made it where we can't do that anymore. So, you know, I'd like to say that it's gonna come back, but it's probably not. So we can't do that targeted advertising anymore. And the marketplace rent area where we can put up rental properties has really filled that void. Now, there are some areas where print advertising works, especially in multifamily. San Antonio is one of those markets. Things just move a little bit slower. And so it's not uncommon for us in San Antonio to put an apartment in the green sheets or in the newspaper. So again, it's about knowing your market, knowing your clientele, and knowing how your clientele finds properties. Now, we also deal with disaster housing and relocation tenants. And so this is really, it has a wide use. It can be a water heater burst and flooded a property, which doesn't sound like it would be that bad. But if your water heater's in your attic on a two-story home, you've now flooded out both floors of your home. If you have a fire in a property, we had a kitchen fire that a tenant did the other day, and those types of things happen. And so what happens is the insurance company is going to pay for them to have a rental property to live in. Usually it's four to six months, and we get a huge premium on rent. So we won't ever take a disaster or a reload tenant in a short-term lease without your approval. We'll approach you with the terms, what we would recommend, and ultimately the choice is yours. But we do a lot of that. And short-term housing right now is pretty common for people relocating here. Um, for those of you that aren't real familiar with Texas metros, Houston and Dallas are gigantic and there are so many suburbs and it's so diverse. Each one's so different. So a lot of people that move here from California where you have to be right in the heart of the city, they get to one of our metros and it's, it's overwhelming. You do research and you, you know, go on the blogs and you ask people, but it's hard to know where you wanna be. And so it's not uncommon for these very high qualified people moving here to decide that they wanna rent for six months while they decide where they wanna be. And this can be a great tool to take a lease that you have coming up in off season. Maybe you bought the property in November and it's done in December where you can tier that lease into prime season, which we do that anyway, but this is a great tool that we can use to get a premium when doing so on the monthly rent. Now, if you have a property that comes available in October, November, December, you're gonna notice we don't do 12 month leases. We're gonna tier it back into prime season. So whenever possible, we're gonna tier leases between March and July. Now, section eight and housing tenants, a lot of people love them, a lot of people hate them. So um, the thing that you have to decide is, are you willing to keep it vacant? At the end of the day, I can go through all the pros, all the cons, but the biggest thing is it has to be vacant to be inspected which for most companies that don't do a re-renting period, that's not a big deal. And so what that means is essentially you have to, if you get a section eight tenant three weeks into your 60 day period, leave it empty from the time the tenant moves out. You can't do anything until the tenant moves out. Then they come in and inspect. Then they do rent reasonableness where they do the market analysis. And then finally they say, okay, they can move in and they send you the lease. That process can easily take 30 days, especially in the bigger housing authorities like Houston and Dallas and those areas. So it's a great tool to have a long-term tenant. Typically, Section 8 tenants don't move until you give them notice. And when the market is doing well and they're well-funded, you can also get rent increases if the rents go up. But it's something you have to keep in mind. That vacancy period is what really does it for me. If I'm already sitting on a vacancy, then okay, I've just renovated the property, the tenant wants to move in quickly, it's a small housing authority, they move quickly, okay, that's great. 
but in many cases, that's not what happens. And so you really have to think about that. Now, the other thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with housing tenants is oftentimes they don't have a lot of income. And so one major life event can set them back significantly. As we've seen with coronavirus, most tenants don't have a nest egg. One missed paycheck and they no longer can afford their lifestyle. It's a sad statement, but that is how the majority of America operates. And so unfortunately, these tenants have a much harder time catching back up. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, there is a lot of demand for Section 8 property. There's not near enough, and most of that need is filled with apartments, not where they want to live. So again, they are often long-term tenants. And then most of the time, I would say 70% of the time, almost all of the rent is paid by housing. Some of the housing authorities have four or five year wait lists. And so when they originally go on the wait list, they may have no income. And by the time they actually get accepted to the program, they may now be making 30 or $40,000 a year. But then they adjust the income down based on their children and their net adjusted income is what they pay a percentage of. So even if they now have decent employment, they may only still have a small portion. So it's very rare that the tenant pays the bulk majority of the rent. But when you see that, it's typically because they have good employment, yet they still qualify for the program. And that's because of those adjustments. Now, what are the benefits of using an agent? And this is really, why do you need us? Well, number one, if you're not a real estate agent and you're not a realtor in the a Realtor Association for that area, you cannot list on realtor.com or the MLS. Zillow has changed a lot of things as well, where only certain MLSs and only certain agents have access to it. Now, they can choose to pay for Zillow listings, but I can tell you for a company like me, that's three or $4,000 a month. Luckily, we are still posting to Zillow, but make sure if you're working with people in other states or other firms that you make sure that they are utilizing Zillow if that's important to you. They do get a lot of page views, but when you look at realtor.com, they get 46 million people using that every month. It costs a tenant nothing to work with an agent, but it gives them a lot of benefits. And that's why many tenants use agents. And tenants that have previously been homeowners, which are often the best quality tenants, they are used to working with agents because most people do use an agent to buy or sell a home. So when they find out they can work with an agent to be able to view rental properties and have one person give you access to everything and it costs them nothing, that's typically what they're going to do. It also makes them feel safer because they're not having to deal with individual owners, individual people, and they have one licensed point of contact who can help them. It does result often in better quality tenants because agents also pre-screen them. We have a long list of questions we go through with people. If they have four pit bulls, we don't wanna go drive out there. If they just got out of jail for murder, we don't wanna go drive out there. And you'd be amazed how many people do call asking for those types of accommodations. Now, as a licensee, we can also run the tenants, process the applications, verify the references, do the lease documents, the marketing, all that stuff. You know all the services we offer. The biggest benefit of using an agent is getting in front of the people and getting in front of the right people. So just keep that in mind. If you were selling your home, most of the time you're gonna use a professional as well. Now, sometimes we have properties that are very difficult to market or we find ourselves in a national emergency like right now, and we have to ask ourselves, what do we do if it still isn't leasing? Now, we're really not having that problem right now. There's a few stubborn properties and some of the lower income areas, but generally right now the market's really crazy. But still sometimes we can wind up in off season, a tenant dies, there's a job loss, something happens and we want to do incentive-based marketing. Number one is free rent. I talked about free rent with immediate move-in. We always wanna make sure that we apply it to the prorated second month, not the first month. So to make sure that we get as much money as possible up front, we charge the full first month's rent at move-in. So let me give you an example. If a tenant is moving in May 15th, they're gonna pay June's rent at move-in, and then they're gonna pay May's prorated rent in June. So any free rent that they might get will come off of June's where they pay prorated May, not the full month's rent at move-in. Why is that? Well, we want to secure as much money as possible up front because the hardest time for tenants is typically after moving expenses, utility deposits, et cetera. So we want them to budget for spending the most upfront so they're not caught off guard month two. Reduced deposits or deposit insurance are a great marketing avenue. You have to remember that we are competing with class A apartments. They're very expensive, but they're very nice. And so most apartment complexes do reduce to no deposits. Well, we used to have to do that too. And then something called deposit insurance came out, which is Rhino. And you've heard me talk about this a lot. And what that allows us to do is still get the amount of a security deposit to compete with apartments, but the tenant doesn't have to pay it up front. 
They pay $8 a month, approximate for about $1,000 in coverage. So for your typical $700 a month apartment, they're paying $5 a month. Tenants don't care. They love the program. We compete above and beyond with apartments because a lot of people don't want to work with the big complexes. And they also think the big complexes won't want to work with them. So they love the mom and pop type landlord and they love property management companies that treat them like a mom and pop landlord. So this allows us to have the best of both worlds. We still get full protection for the amount of a security deposit, but we can treat it like a no deposit property. So this has been a great tactic to use for hard to rent properties and specifically for lower income apartments. What type of tenant does this attract? The goal is not to attract bad tenants. I get this question a lot. The goal is to compete with apartments and deposit free properties. Flexible lease terms go a long way, like I talked about, six, 12, 18 month leases. Right now, a lot of tenants are asking for long leases. I've had three or four apps this week asking for five year leases. It's almost laughable when you think about it that people are so scared that they wanna lock in somewhere for eight years, but I also can understand the panic. And so, of course, we're never gonna recommend anything that long. Typically, I don't even like anything longer than 18 months, but sometimes you might wanna lease to a tenant for two years. My preference is to get to know the tenant, have them for a year, and then renew to a longer term lease if they're a good tenant. Look at a lease like a marriage. You don't wanna to commit to somebody for a really long time until you're ready to get married. And a new tenant who just applies, they may look great on paper, but some of our most difficult tenants are the best qualified because they know they can be demanding and they're used to being able to have beautiful, clean, perfect properties because they've been homeowners. So just keep that in mind. And then finally, if we have a property that's difficult to lease, we can include incentives. Things like rubs, maybe you reduce the rub amount or you don't charge them back for a utility, you're one. Maybe you pay their lawn care or their pool care. Maybe you give them a discount on something. So there's a lot of ways to incentivize tenants. Just keep in mind that you set a precedent and it's important that you treat everyone the same. And so you wanna make sure if you're offering an incentive to one person in a property, if you have other units available with similar people applying, you want to make sure that you're offering the same thing across the board. And so that's one of the things that we help guide you on as we're looking at incentives. Now, there's also incentives that we can do for the agents who are showing the properties. So let me put this into perspective for you. And this doesn't apply to my agents, but looking at traditional real estate firms that make money on their agents. So all of your big names, this is how they work. An average agent fee is about 10 to 20% or more plus monthly fees. So if your property is offering 35% commission on a $1,300 rental, they earn a $455 fee minus their split to their firm. So they're paying 10 to 20% out of that plus gas, plus probably monthly fees for being an agent. A lot of companies charge three to $500 a month or desk fees, other fees. So by the time they get paid, they're only making a couple hundred dollars. And just like home buyers, tenants can wanna see a lot of properties and that money eats up very quickly. Then you look in a market like this where you've got a virus or something going around, agents are gonna be less likely to wanna show if it's only for 150 or $200. So. You've got a property that's harder to lease and you wanna get agents to show it, there's a great way to do that and that's by increasing the commission. So when you see us say we're gonna increase the commission to 40 or 50%, that's why you see us do that because now that agent is making enough money to entice them to want to show your property potentially over others. Some agents may avoid a listing offering less than 35%. In my experience, that's the golden number and so that's the minimum that we recommend. Some multifamily will go down to 30%, and that's because often agents don't list apartments on MLS, so we do something a little bit unique. There's not as much competition. But keep in mind, apartment locators often make 100% of the first month's rent from big apartment complexes. So it's important you still offer something to incentivize them to show your property. And then of course, remember, most high quality tenants do work with an agent, especially on single family. Now, let's talk about a couple of fair housing things that I wanted to go over. There's been some changes and we're actually gonna do a law update class, I think next week on the 5th. But I wanted just to go over a little bit of this because we're talking about tenants. So there's a lot of misconceptions about who you can deny to rent to. And so I wanted to cover some of the things that we hear. I only wanna to rent to a family. I don't wanna to rent to a single man. They have too many kids and they'll trash the place. They're too young to be responsible. These types of things cannot be weighted in assessing an application. Their familial status, how many people are gonna live there, the ages of who are gonna live there, what they look like, those types of things we cannot consider. If you ask us who's on the application, we're going to tell you, we're gonna give you the information, but we cannot use that in determination and neither can you. So there's something called desperate impact. 
This is another thing that's gone through the court systems and it's kind of a gray area right now, but essentially it says this, one in four Americans have a criminal record. The majority of criminals are minorities. So by saying you won't take people with a criminal record, you are thereby discriminating against minorities. A leap? Probably. Is it something that's being charged? Absolutely. So it's very important that your criminal record denials have something to do with a property, something that would put your property or the people around your property in imminent danger. So if somebody has a charge where they got pulled over in a car for speeding 10 years ago and they found some marijuana in the car, that doesn't directly affect your property. I wouldn't deny a tenant for that. Often we can find other reasons. Maybe their credit isn't so great. Maybe they don't have great rental history, but that criminal charge from 10 years ago that has no bearing on the property really should not weigh in your decision. Now, if you have a tenant that has a sexual registration, maybe they're a sex offender, or you have someone with a family violence charge from a year ago, that can directly affect the occupancy of your property. That's different. So make sure that you're using criminal records appropriately, and we will always make those recommendations for you. Now, there's a lot of differences between accommodations and modifications as it comes to those that are handicapped. So the ADA, of course, prohibits discrimination against those that are disabled, and it does apply to housing and your policy about your rentals. You can't really ask someone about their disability, nor can you really ask for proof of the disability. Now, when we get to service animals and emotional support animals, that's a little different. Those laws have changed as well. But when we're talking about someone who's in a wheelchair, we can't ask them why they're in a wheelchair. That's a good example to consider. Now, tenants have to be allowed to make modifications needed to the property. Protected disabilities are mobility, hearing, visual, chronic alcoholism only if they're in a treatment recovery program, mental illness, HIV and AIDS and related, and then mental retardation. So these are the protected disabilities. And so a good example of this is if a tenant is in a wheelchair and we need to widen the doorway inside the unit, that is a reasonable modification. Now, traditionally, modifications are not something you have to pay for. The tenant can be responsible to pay for it. It can be responsible to be done professionally, and they have to return it in the condition that they found it. However, you cannot tell them that they cannot do it. The kind of threshold for this is, does it cause an undue financial burden for the landlord? And in this case, the tenant is paying for it, so it's not gonna be an undue financial burden. Now, if they have to take apart your entire property, remove every single molding, it's thousands and thousands of dollars in damage that they may not be able to fix at the end, that's an undue financial burden for you. So there is some gray area here and we help you navigate that if and when it happens. I could tell you that items like this happen very rarely. Maybe a few times a year we have these requests. It's more common, I would say, in multifamily than it is in single family, because most of the time in single family, they're just gonna find a property that fits their needs. However, that being said, grab bars are pretty common. And that doesn't have to be someone who is disabled. It can be someone who's elderly, someone who maybe has a seizure disorder, maybe they have a special needs child. And generally those are pretty easy to install and remove. So that's what a modification is. Now, the flip side of that is an accommodation. And so this is something that you as a landlord are required to do. This typically comes into play at multifamily properties. The most common one we see is someone who's disabled, who needs a downstairs unit or an upfront handicapped parking space. That is something you have to be able to accommodate them for. Maybe they need a wheelchair ramp to be able to get into the common area to get to their apartment. And then of course, service animals. So let's talk about that. 67% of households have pets. It is a consideration whether or not to accept pets. I always tell people pets are like guns. Everyone in Texas has one. So it's important that you don't say no pets. Of course, it's your choice. You can tell us you don't want pets and we won't rent to a pet but I do recommend you consider pets. It truly is important just because you're going to kick too many tenants if you don't. Now, insurance companies have done a lot of things to try to stave people off from having pets and rental properties. So there are insurance concerns, not only for breed, but also for dog bites. And so you wanna make sure that your insurance policy covers you for pets, whether or not you accept them. Inevitably, at some point, you're going to have a tenant that breaks the rules and puts a pet in the property that's not allowed to be there. Maybe it's because Fluffy had a puppy, Maybe it's because Fluffy was lonely and needed a friend, or maybe it's because the kid wanted a dog and they wanted to try to skirt by. Keep in mind, most property managers don't do visits four times a year, so they don't think they're gonna get caught. I can tell you, even my first apartment, they only thought I had four dogs and I had five. So even some of us that are upstanding members of society skirt by on this rule. 
Why didn't I tell them about number five? He was a Siberian Husky and he was on the aggressive breed list. Was he aggressive? Absolutely not. As a property manager, do I agree with those lists? Absolutely not. But do I know that good tenants skirt that rule? Absolutely. So make sure that you have a policy that allows that and is going to cover you in the event that a dog bites somebody. I always give the example, if you have a policy with no coverage or with aggressive breed non-coverage, what happens if you're in South Harris County or South Dallas County? So say you're in Houston proper, Dallas proper, there are stray dogs everywhere, many of which are pit bulls. One of those dogs wanders into your front yard and bites a child in the front yard. If you have no dog bite coverage, you have no dog bite coverage. Very, very important because some things are outside of your control. I can tell you in my whole career, I can't think of a single dog bite case that we filed an insurance policy on. It's not common, but it only takes one. So make sure your insurance company has coverage for that. Neutered versus not neutered is a concern. A lot of pets, if they're not neutered, they spray or they mark. They tend to do more damage and they tend to be more aggressive. Renter's insurance is not the fix. Most renter's insurance also have breed and bite exclusions. It's important that they carry it. We're gonna demand they carry it, but you must make sure your policy has the proper coverage. The other piece you wanna make sure is you're charging a pet deposit and a non-refundable pet fee. So a non-refundable pet fee is a cash payment made at move-in that is your money to keep as consideration for allowing them to have the pet. The pet deposit adds to the security deposit and is something that can be fully used for any damages. And because it becomes a part of the security deposit, we can use it for non-pet damages as well. Great thing about Rhino, if you're doing Rhino, is tenants aren't gonna balk at that pet deposit because we're just gonna roll it into the Rhino policy, so it costs them about $1.50 a month. Again, great things about deposit insurance. So let's talk about service animals. What qualifies as a service animal? It must perform a job or a function. Okay, so the CNI dog, the walking dog, the dog who can sense seizures, these are service animals. They perform a function. They are a tool. You cannot charge pet deposits. You cannot charge pet fees. You cannot even do a pet agreement because they are not a pet. They are a tool and you cannot ever refer to them as a pet. Breed does not matter. So if you have a pit bull that is a service animal, and trust me, it happens all the time, you want to make sure you reach out to your insurance company and tell them they must cover this pet and get their response that they will because of the fact it is a service animal. We talked about this in the NREIG class. <laughs> this is something that's very, very important as a landlord. I have a lot of aggressive breed dogs in my properties because they are service animals or emotional support animals. And unfortunately, there's not a lot that we can do. Now, with emotional support animals, there were some law changes that went into effect that gave us some teeth. So if you go back six months ago, tenants could go online, pay $10, go to an online certificate website and download a certificate from some therapist or doctor that says they need an emotional support animal. And we had to take it. There was really no way around that. And I had some tenants who had four emotional support animals. And we've had everything you can imagine. We've had little Yorkies who do CPR. We've had, I mean, the stories over the years. And so it's important that we help those who need service animals. And it's important that we help those who need emotional support animals, but they must really need them. So a lot of people tell us, oh, I have a service animal. He's, he's certified. He's a certified service animal. To which my response is, okay. What service does he provide for you? Please provide me documentation. And in that case, oftentimes they don't have any documentation because yes, he may have attended a service dog class, but that does not make him a service dog because he is not performing a job or a function for that person. The new law that went into effect gave us a lot more teeth to be able to ask those questions, especially about emotional support animals. And it really has made it to where we're having a lot fewer of them and the abuse is not happening from tenants wanting to have so many and so many of them that really don't have a need. So now the person who writes the letter and makes the recommendation must be directly familiar with the tenant and it cannot be these cheap online certificates. They actually went so far as to invest and ask the federal government to investigate these companies who are servicing and selling those certificates. So. I hope this was helpful, gives you an insight into what we look for for applications. And then of course, for those of you already under management, you know that every single lease application that comes into the company comes to me and you at the same time. 
and I will make my recommendations, keeping all of these items in mind. As always, we appreciate you joining us. We appreciate your business and I'll look forward to seeing everyone next week.